I want to talk about cholesterol. I've had a few people on the show say that the concept of high cholesterol being bad is a myth. What's your take on cholesterol and also low cholesterol? Because that was something I saw in my lab work and I was told that that's unhealthy as well. Mm -hmm. This is one that kind of baffles me because if you look at the entire body of literature looking at cholesterol and heart disease, it seems incredibly difficult to take the position that high cholesterol is not a problem. Let me walk through that. So let's start off with, there are, I mentioned earlier, there are different types of, of studies and study design. Some of them are more valid, more reliable than others. So let's start off with observational studies, which I would say in terms of what I'm going to talk about are the least reliable. We see very clearly in populations, highest cholesterol, serum cholesterol, so cholesterol in blood, higher risk of coronary heart disease. Is that the same as LDL? Yes. Okay. So when I say serum cholesterol, uh, I'm speaking to, I'm really speaking to ApoB. I'm just being careful not to go down a rabbit hole here. We appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're speaking to the number of lipoproteins, low density lipoprotein is a lipoprotein, the number of lipoproteins in the blood that are potentially atherogenic. What that means is they can go into the artery wall and provoke an inflammatory response and get stuck in there. And LDL, low density lipoproteins, are the most abundant of the ApoB containing lipoproteins. You might hear of ApoB and people talking about it. ApoB essentially sums up LDL plus the other atherogenic lipoproteins and gives you a kind of a better window into how many of these particles are flowing in your blood. In population studies, when you go and look at the concentration of these atherogenic lipoproteins in people's blood, the higher the concentration, the more risk of coronary heart disease. Then we have a whole another type of study called a Mendelian randomization, which looks at genetic, genetic levels of LDL cholesterol and risk of coronary heart disease. Because there are a number of different gene mutations which affect your level of LDL cholesterol. So you can go out and look in the general public and look at people that have genetically very low LDL cholesterol, very high and everything in between. And you can chart that and you see a linear relationship. So the higher that, that person's LDL cholesterol, the higher their risk of coronary heart disease. Me and my husband are actually a good example. I have low LDL and he has high mm -hmm. and heart disease runs in his family, I believe. Right. So that's the, the genetic studies. And when you look at that curve, it's very steep. So for every unit increase in LDL cholesterol, mm. the rise in risk of coronary heart disease is actually much greater than in population studies. And the reason for that is that lifetime exposure matters. When we're talking about genetic studies, we're talking about people that are exposed to that LDL cholesterol from birth. Does that mean that the parents are feeding them a lot of saturated fats from a young age? Your parents' diet can affect your cholesterol levels, but what I'm talking about here is particular genetic mutations that affect cholesterol levels for that newborn. And so they're from that very young age, because typically a newborn's cholesterol, LDL cholesterol is like 20 to 30 milligrams per deciliter. Okay. Very, very low. And but there are these gene mutations that exist that will mean that certain individuals from, a, from birth will be exposed to different LDL cholesterol levels throughout their life. Okay. Okay. The point I'm trying to make there is that lifetime exposure matters when we're talking about how does LDL cholesterol affect our risk, mm. right? If, it's, if, if we have low LDL cholesterol for a lot of our life and then we adopt a ketogenic diet for one or two years, our risk of coronary heart disease is not the same as someone who had elevated LDL cholesterol from birth. It's the same as saying, you know, if, if we started smoking cigarettes from birth versus starting to smoke cigarettes at age 30, our okay. risk of lung cancer would look different. 
right? And researchers are actually now uh, in the lung cancer science, people talk about uh, pack years in terms of your exposure. And now in this area of science, we're talking about cholesterol years. So are you saying that ketogenic diets increase your risk of cardiovascular disease? Ketogenic diets that are very rich in saturated fat, because not all ketogenic diets are the same. Mm. I'm asking because I did it for yeah. two if, years. <laughs> you know, there, there's a study looking at uh, healthy adult women in aged on average in their 20s who adopted a high saturated fat uh, ketogenic diet and they looked over a four-week period at how did their LDL cholesterol change. And they saw that their LDL cholesterol increased by 1.8 millimoles per liter. Now, if those genetic studies that I measured, that I mentioned before, they allow us to see on a per unit basis for LD, of LDL cholesterol, if someone's exposed to that over a long time, what is their reduction in risk of or increase in risk of coronary heart disease? For every one millimoles per liter, that LDL cholesterol is increased when you're exposed to that over decades. There's about a 55% increased risk of coronary heart disease. Okay. okay. One, one millimoles per liter, 55% increase in coronary heart disease. We get that from the genetic studies looking at lifetime exposure. In this ketogenic study, their LDL cholesterol went up by 1.8 millimoles per liter which represents if they were to stick with that diet over decades, you know, possibly a doubling in their risk of coronary heart disease. Mm. Now we're extrapolating, that's a four-week study. It's looking at changes in LDL cholesterol. It's not looking at heart outcomes. Yeah. So we're extrapolating based on the genetic studies to say what would this kind of risk look like. And I have the conclusion though from that paper, I think I printed it out here, the current trial shows that feeding healthy young women a ketogenic, low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet rich in saturated fatty acids for four weeks resulted in profound alterations in the blood lipid profile. LDL cholesterol increased in every participant with a treatment effect of 1.82 millimoles per liter. These alterations should be a cause for concern in young, normal weight, healthy women following this kind of low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet. I mean... I should have been in that study because I've done that before. Yeah. I did it for a long time, actually. It's interesting. I, I want to ask, is it difficult to collect data? Because how can you have someone stay keto for their whole life to see if it ends up having long-term effects? Well, that's on why we need the observational and the genetic studies because mm. we're not going to have a randomized controlled trial where you you randomize someone to a particular diet and expect them to adhere to that for life. Well, right? what about this like, study was a four-week study. Mm. The, the observational studies, epidemiology, where we go out and look at populations and we can do dietary um, food frequency questionnaire surveys to see how people eat and validate them against weight food records, they allow us to look at how diet affects certain variables over the long term. And they have some limitations, but they're allowing us to fill in the gaps because there are certain questions that randomized controlled trials cannot answer. It's just not feasible to conduct them for that long. Right. right? So at the beginning, I was explaining the different levels of science that, that show that high cholesterol increases risk of coronary heart disease. So I spoke about the population studies. I spoke about the genetic studies. Then we, have, we do have randomized controlled trials we have pharmaceutical studies. So looking at people who are high risk of cardiovascular disease and you give them a particular drug that lowers their cholesterol and you see in the four or five year follow-up period, which is how long these trials go for, they don't go for ever because of how expensive they are, you see dramatic reductions in coronary heart disease. Now, those, that reduction in risk per unit is much smaller than what I spoke about on the Mendelian studies before. And it makes sense. These are often people that are 60 years old who have had high cholesterol their whole life and you reduce their cholesterol for five years 
you can't expect their risk of coronary heart disease to be the same as someone who had that low level of cholesterol for their whole life. Okay. Okay. But we have these, what I would call converging lines of evidence, population studies, genetic Mendelian randomization studies, randomized controlled trials that all show us pointing in the same direction that when you get your cholesterol down, you reduce your risk of coronary heart disease. Now, just to, to kind of underline the importance of this, coronary heart disease is the number one cause of death in this country, in the UK, in Australia. And what we understand is that the concentration of those ApoB containing lipoproteins determines how likely you are to be laying down this plaque in the artery wall that builds up over time and at some point can predispose you to having a heart attack or a stroke. And through all of this research, we've been able to identify, well, what's that threshold? Where does it become a problem where you're actually accumulating plaque in the artery? And so for me, it would seem sensible. I wanna go to bed every night knowing that the concentration of those particles is below that threshold. I'm not getting plaque building up. And at the same time, I, want, I don't want to be insulin resistant. I don't want high blood pressure. These are all other risk factors. And often people point to them and say, well, if you don't have insulin resistance, it doesn't matter. What we need to understand is that the injurious component and what starts this process is the concentration of ApoB containing lipoproteins, of which LDL is the most abundant. And sure, if you want to stack on top of that smoking and drinking alcohol and insulin resistance, that's like adding fuel to the flame. Mm. But the flame and the initial process is being instigated or started by those ApoB containing lipoproteins in the first place. And the other part of your question was about low cholesterol. So this takes us into the territory of observational studies. There are some observational studies that have shown that low cholesterol late in life is associated with increased mortality. Now, I've got to fix that. <laughs> and, and, and so you can, you can go and if you just look at that evidence at face value, you, you might you know, be able to support your position online that low cholesterol is a bad thing. But in those studies, when they actually adjust for certain disease states, that goes away. So this is considered what we call reverse causality. Essentially, there are certain disease states that cause metabolic dysregulation. And part of that metabolic dysregulation is a lowering in cholesterol. It's not that the low cholesterol led to that disease and the premature death. These people were sick. Mm. They had a whole lot of derangements. And when you control for that, that association goes away. The other thing that people are often concerned about is that cholesterol, low cholesterol levels in the blood will somehow affect hormone levels or cholesterol levels in the brain. The first thing is for people to understand is that all of your cells throughout your body produce all the cholesterol they need. These lipoproteins are not taking cholesterol to your cells. So that cholesterol that's in your blood that's not being distributed out to your cells. Those lipoproteins, their, their purpose is to take energy, triglycerides, out to cells. The cholesterol that's in those lipoproteins is literally just there to enable that lipoprotein to, to be spherical and flow through the blood. We know that. So when you look at hormone levels in people with very low LDL cholesterol, be it genetic or induced by by drugs, they're completely fine because those cells are manuf manufacturing all of the cholesterol they need. In fact, most of the cells throughout our body, if anything, manufacture excess cholesterol and their lipoproteins are taking that excess cholesterol from the cells back to the liver. That's what they should be doing. And then with regards to the brain, your serum cholesterol that you measure on a blood test has nothing to do with the cholesterol levels in your brain. There's a blood-brain barrier. Cholesterol synthesis in the brain is completely independent. 
to cholesterol synthesis in the liver and throughout the systemic body. So there's no reason to be worried about cholesterol levels in the brain if you're doing certain things with your lifestyle to reduce your serum cholesterol. And there's no reason to be worried about your hormone production because as I said, all of those cells throughout the body are perfectly capable of producing all of the cholesterol that they need. And this is something that I discussed. I had a three-part series, lipid series, with Dr. Thomas Dayspring. Wow. And it was seven hours long. On your podcast? Yeah, it was seven hours long. Oh. And this is one of the frustrating <laughs> things is that, you know, there's a, a law called Brandolini's Law. And essentially, I won't be able to quote this verbatim, but the amount of energy required to refute bullshit or you know claims online is an order of magnitude greater than the amount of energy that was required to make that claim mm. right so we spent seven hours unpacking this and then you'll see a claim online where someone will say hey you don't want uh, low blood cholesterol because cholesterol is important in the brain well i feel like it's also difficult to communicate information because everything's so condensed online and people only want to watch 10 seconds. 